Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Blind Ambition with Jack Kelly. It's your friend Rick from Blind, and today we have Ariella Steinhorn and Amber Scora from Lioness. Ariella is the co-founder and CEO of Lioness. In 2018, Ariella co-founded Simone, an organization that connected workers with employment lawyers. She was previously one of the youngest communications hires at Uber and has led policy, corporate, and internal communications at subsidiaries of Ford and WeWork. Amber is the co-founder, president, and partner at Lioness, and she's a writer and published author. Her work has been featured in the New York Times, the Washington Post, USA Today, Boston Globe, Los Angeles Times, and more. And for those of you that don't know, Lioness is a new media company that helps people bring forward stories about power. It's been an incredible resource for whistleblowers who have reported issues of workplace discrimination and sexual harassment, but also stories about financial fraud white collar crimes, and unethical and manipulative business practices. Thanks for coming on the show, Amber and Ariella. Thanks Thank for having us. So I, I know it was a bit of a mouthful, but I was wondering, can you walk us through the origin story of Lioness? Like, how did you come together and why did you decide to start Lioness? Sure, I can begin. Um, so my background is actually in corporate PR, um, like you, Rick. And I worked for a number of tech startups initially at Uber um, in the very early days in 2014 when it was still a fledgling PR team and no one really knew what they were doing, kind of building the plane as they were flying it. Um, and then I went on to work for a number of other tech startups, a subsidiary of um, Ford and a subsidiary of WeWork. And um, I got really interested, of course, I, I was able to see how narrative was able to help corporate entities and um, companies tell their side of the story. But I was also interested in not just what the company had to say, because obviously when you're in PR, you have to um, represent one side of the story. I was interested in like all of the sides of the story. And I noticed I was actually getting along better with some of the journalists who I was working with, as opposed to some of my other PR colleagues. It's not to say I disliked them, but I just wanted to know the truth about everything and um, wasn't always all that satisfied with like the one answer that you had to, or the one talking point that the company said that you had to say, because of course I knew that there was so much more there. So um, always kind of had that uh, just feeling simmering. And then um, after a few uh, unfortunate workplace experiences, um, I ended up having to hire an employment lawyer at one point to get out of a, a, a workplace situation. And, you know, going into your career, you never think that you will have to hire a lawyer. Um, but what I realized was that um, the lawyer and also my therapist at the time were two resources outside of a workplace that had helped me so much in just like advancing in my life. And um, so got really interested in employment law and um, that's how Simone started, which was kind of the first iteration of Lioness, which helped people connect to employment lawyers if they were going through something difficult at work. So, so many people, we did a little bit of press around it and people just came out of the woodwork with crazy workplace stories. Um, and, uh, but I was seeing all of these stories signed away. People were signing NDAs and, um, you know, wanting to get a severance agreement or package and move forward from those situations, which is totally fair. Um, but I was also interested in this idea of like, what if some of these stories were able to see the, the light of day? How could culture actually change as a result of that? So I married this PR background and this, um, this weird desire I have to know everything about everything um, with this employment law uh, knowledge that I had started to build upon and started Lioness, which became a place for people to bring any story that they have about power to us and we can help them figure out how to navigate the media, um, lawyers, uh, all of the resources that you need when you think about going up against something that's powerful or maybe deciding not to do it. Um, and then I connected with Amber very soon after I started. Um, she can tell you a little bit about her background. 
Yeah, I have a very weird background in that um, I grew up in a very, um, you could say, culty religious group. And when I was already like in my early 30s, I was a missionary in China and like was really going to the ends of the earth, preaching about this religion I had been raised in. And then I started to have an epiphany, like I started to wake up and realize that um, through a series of events that I was in this religion that was kind of harmful and I wanted to get out. And so I ended up getting out. It was um you know, a whole ordeal because they're the type of religion that shuns you. And then eventually I wrote a book that you could say I was a whistleblower before I knew what whistleblowing was because nobody ever talks about this religion when they leave because um, the consequences for your personal life are so severe. You get cut off by your family. So I ended up writing this book and um, it get, got published and I ended up getting quite a bit of media for it. Uh, and so I kind of through that process, like just without even realizing it, came to learn what it was like to suddenly, you know, be put in the spotlight, much like a whistleblower does, to have consequences for coming forward, and to just understand very viscerally what it was like to have a story that was painful in some ways, and that some people were mad at you for talking about, and then bring that forward and like the cascading things that come from that and flow from that, both good and and negative sometimes. So that I think is something that like really helps me now in the work with Lioness. And also because I'm a writer, um, uh, Ariella mentioned that we sometimes publish now people's accounts on our own website, lioness.co. Um, and we do that because sometimes the stories we have, even though they're true, the regular media doesn't take them up. Um, and so we often help people ghostwrite because not everyone that has a story um, is a person who writes um, or knows how to tell that story necessarily on their own. So um, that's uh, basically how the publishing side of Lioness emerged. And um, I think that behind the scenes, because Ariel and I both have gone through you know, things in the workplace or in our personal lives that were difficult and came through on the other side, um, we found that that background, both of our backgrounds really help support people along through this process. And sometimes in a way that um, if it was just a journalist, they could not because a journalist has to maintain a bit more detachment. But we basically support people as they're going right from the very beginning, teaching them about document safety, helping them decide what they wanna do, helping them project forward about what that might look like. Um, and then that basically is how we help people bring their stories forward. And we met, by the way, cause you asked that, we met on LinkedIn. <laughs> Maybe if Blonde had existed back then, we would have on Blonde. <laughs> the Tinder for co-founders. <laughs> That's right. Now, I, I'm curious, what happens, you know, that leads up to the point of whistleblowers coming out of the, wheel, the work, right? Like the woodwork. Is it typically, like, do you find that there's like a typical profile of like an industry or a certain company or are there kind of like signs that we might be able to see ahead of time that like, oh gosh, there might be something brewing there? And is there like a tipping point when, uh, you know, these whistleblowers, these affected people actually feel confident or comfortable enough to say something or do something? Yeah, I think that there's this misconception about whistleblowers sometimes that they're this like these disgruntled rogue people who like at the first sight of any problem they like go straight to the sec or the press and like that is not what we've experienced at all i think most people who come to us um have experienced a number of things over a long period of time and they have seen their colleagues experience something similar oftentimes um i mean i think it does take a specific kind of person with a very steely backbone and a desire to um, poke at power a little bit. I don't know where that comes from, it's, if it's from childhood or a series of experiences that led them to be this way. But I think that you know it, it takes a certain type of personality, but also it's not like they're jumping to whistleblow. They're not like jumping at the bit to whistleblow immediately. They have experienced um, you know, the, there's this phrase death by a thousand paper cuts of like all of these, um, I hate the word microaggression, but like all of these like little things that happen or sometimes big things that happen. And then sometimes it's just too much to bear and they're ready to figure out what to do about it. And oftentimes they do care about, you know, 
getting the truth out for themselves. Sometimes it is, frankly, it can be a little bit um, selfishly motivated because like who among us is not somewhat selfish of like, I want to just get the truth out for myself. But then it also can be, you know, um, intertwined with that can be, they care about um, the public knowing about this and just, just wanting to bring something that's been suppressed or, hidden to light um, just for the, the world to be able to know that something is happening um, or to be able to do it for their colleagues who are still there and may not have that same backbone, but they want to help. Um, that's what I would say, but the, the profile of person and why they come out. What, what are some, some examples that you've seen personally? You know, because just seeing the news, you have like Sam Bankman Freed recently in terms of that just epic blow up of his cryptocurrency exchange. Do you see things of that epic proportion or it, it runs the gamut from kind of small matters to just, oh my gosh, I can't believe this person did such and such. This is terrible. Uh, I would say it runs the gamut and we've helped all different sorts of people from all over the country, from every political spectrum. Um, uh, I would say that part of what happens is that people don't, people that come to us don't always no, even with what they're sitting on is big or small. And because we hear so many stories and sort of have a sense for um, what is going on in, in, in the workplace and in different environments, um, people will often come to us and be like, you know, am I at the beginning of the process? They might be like, okay, I, I feel like something's wrong, but am I crazy or am I just like overreacting? So we'll often help people do a gut check on that and like get taken more information. Um, and often this process takes a long time. Like sometimes people contact us and we might not come forward with something for like a year afterwards because people are not always ready either. Like when they start to realize what they're sitting on, then they start to realize what the consequences will be. And I, I've really seen an arc. Some people halfway through will decide, you know what, it's not worth it. I don't want to risk a legal case. I don't have the funds to bankroll this. I don't want to blow up my career. But I have noticed that there are people that as Ariela said, it's like a certain, whether it's a personality trait or they're just mad enough or they're fed up enough, there's some turning point. And I can always tell when someone's gonna go the whole way because they just, there's this change in them and they're just like ready to burn it down. And they're at that point is where I think that you see the whistleblower coming, side coming out of people. I, don't, I haven't seen a lot of people start that way, but as they go through the process, they get to the point where they're like, no, there's no turning back for me and I will take whatever consequences come. Do you, you see, is it kind of like blatant fraud that people come to you or do you feel like, or do some people just feel they've been discriminated against because of their race, religion, whatever the case may be? Um, but what are some examples that you see on a, on, a, on a kind of a regular basis? Yeah, it's really all of the above. Um, sometimes it's just someone who's, who says my, my boss has been really mean and abusive to me. Um, which is tricky legally. We actually get a lot of those because legally it's not, it's not illegal to be a bully at work. Um, you can, if you are a member of a protected class and you can prove that you were discriminated against for being a woman or a person of color, um, then you have a case. But if it's, if it's just like an equal opportunity asshole, like you can't, like there's no legal recourse. So a lot of people will come to us with stories of just people being really like mean and disrespectful to them. Um, so sometimes we'll just, you know, that's not necessarily a new story, but we'll hear them out and like validate their experience. And I think that even just someone hearing them out is helpful to people. Um, and then, yeah, it can be like bigger discrimination cases that are pretty explicit. Um, and then we have been starting to receive um, more fraud stories and usually they're like we had one story um where someone said that initially like she thought it was discrimination and it turned out that it was fraud because um and a lot of times you will see like the person the one person in the room who doesn't look like everybody else or doesn't act or you know doesn't have the same background as everyone else maybe they're more um likely to speak up um, about something that they're seeing and then they'll start to get iced out. So they could think that it's initially discrimination because you know they may be the only one um, of their kind in a room, but then um, the realization can seep in that like, oh, 
there's something bigger going on here. And like, I, this is just the tip of the iceberg of what like everyone else is telling the public and investors maybe and customers the same story. And I've seen a discrepancy in the story and they don't, you know, they don't like that I've brought this out. So I'm now getting iced out. Um, and that can start as a feeling of being discriminated against, but then turn into, wow, like this is, this could be something more nefarious, systemic, um, et cetera. And we've also had stories, like we've had a, a whistleblower from Boeing who's come to us and we helped publish his account of, um, you know, when the 737 MAX planes got, they back, went back to flying. He was like, well, the actual, issues have not been addressed and he has a lot of evidence corroborated by the Ethiopian reports of the crash there and such. Um, we had another man who was inside a drug mandated rehab center where the rehab center was taking funds from the government um, because this was supposedly a way, a pathway around, you know, to get, go around getting, getting going to jail to instead go to rehab, but inside the rehab center in fact, there was no counseling. There was drug use was rampant. Basically, it was like the company was just taking the money from the government, but not providing any services at all and giving these people certificates saying they had had rehab where they would just end up going and using drugs as soon as they get back on the street and go back to jail again. So there's things like that, too. It's almost it's just, I think almost like as long as people find us, we would that like we would take in any story and of course we fact check we make sure it's legitimate but it has really run the gamut and it's, so it's sometimes workplaces and sometimes outside of workplaces too that's so what i seem to recall for a few years with boeing yeah that they had planes that crashed and they say oh no everything is fine and then they you know fly another one and it crashes and you would think that after a couple of incidents they would say wait a minute let, let's 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 really do an internal deep dive to see what are we doing right and what are we doing wrong and that's one of the biggest fears being on a plane and worrying about is it could be safe or not i mean i don't fly on those planes anymore after <laughs> <laughs> the whistleblower i always check um but yeah it's like it is um it is really, it is really interesting because a lot of times these people too, like with the Boeing whistleblower, he did try to go to national media, but they had already covered that first wave. And Boeing has like 15 PR teams feeding the news media that the plane is safe and that this is now the story in, in the minds of like journalists that worked on it. Sort of like, well, this case, this news arc has already gone around. Hey, we're over with it. We're on to the next one. Yeah. But in the meantime, like, well, it will be done, as he says, until another plane crashes, and he's trying to prevent that. So that's often where Linus can fill in the gaps, too, in that, like, some, just sometimes things will, the journalists will feel that, like, their editors are like, well, we've already written that story, so we've moved on. And so we'll also sometimes pick up people like that, too. Did you ever get any, any whistleblower complaints from people uh, in nursing homes, especially during covid not yet, no. We got some hospital um, complaints during COVID, but not no nursing homes. All right, I might have some leads for you. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yes. I mean, yes, a, a friend of mine uh, runs uh, kind of, you know, uh, his career is dealing with nursing homes. And during COVID, well, what happened, they were stockpiling people there who they knew had COVID, brought them into, into you know, the nursing homes. And they infected everybody. Oh and then, as you can imagine, that cohort, the age of them, and COVID, it's that's that's the exact, you know, epicenter of where people are the most at risk. So, um, yeah, I wonder if you might get some of these things. Probably a lagging in, indicator too. I, I bet, right, where they don't come right away, where it takes a while for them to realize, oh my gosh, wait a minute, I, I assumed everything was okay, but now I'm hearing about these other things. Yeah, I got a complaint here. Yeah, we've and had also stories that have. Oh, go ahead. There you go. It's okay. Oh, I was just gonna say we've had stories that have taken sometimes twenty plus years to come to us, where the person has been sitting on something for decades, and then they read something in the news or something just like sparks them, and they come to us. But no, I mean with the nursing home story, I feel like that's probably like the most vulnerable population um, that can't really advocate for themselves. So. I mean, that's a huge one. Yeah, can you just imagine where, do you remember back then you had the the big ocean liners, right? And they didn't let them, you know, they were just staying in the ocean 
right? But then they finally kind of let people off and then they let them off who, who were sick and then put them in places, you know, where the people are vulnerable. And I, I, I bet you something that's going to start coming out, you know, as time goes on and they realize family members say, oh my gosh, let's look into it. Or how many people were put on ventilators who didn't need to go on ventilators because these hospitals made way more money putting someone on a ventilator than not putting them on a ventilator. And um, more to think about, it, there's a lot of stuff out there. You, you know, I think I think you guys are going to have a lot of work to do. Yeah, and but, as we've noticed, is like the court of public opinion is sometimes the only thing that can get something to change. Mm -hmm. and so a lot, and a lot of the times, it's sadly the way that the system is set up is that the government does rely on whistleblowers to come forward um, to expose things rather than, you know, there's just not enough people, investigators from the top down, you know, America is a place that doesn't have a lot of regulations compared to some other countries. Um, but of course, we still want to know if something's wrong. And sometimes it is someone on the inside. And often it is someone on the inside that will expose something like that. And I think where Lioness sits now is it was a bit of a gap that didn't exist before in that, like, we've had people come to us that did submit tips to the like, tip lines at news outlets, but you know more and more journalists are getting laid off all the time. That there's almost like a narrowing resource for people to get stories out, and so um, in a way we we started line us start to kind of fill that gap because we can be, we we will sort of take a more hands on approach. We, we're not a huge news organization. It's just Ariel and I. So there's sort of like a, a personal touch. And sometimes we get the people that have tried to bring something to the media. That is a big story and they didn't ever hear back. And then what happens? Will you then partner with different law firms and say, hey, I think we have some case here. Can you take a look at it from a legal perspective and then hand it off? Is that how it works? Sometimes, yes. It, it definitely depends on what the person wants to do. Um, but we always recommend that they do talk to a lawyer before they go the media route just so they can know like had they signed an agreement like what are, what are the ramifications of me breaking an agreement um and it's not that the employer will always act and like it's it's pretty egregious for an employer to sue someone for breaking an agreement if what they're revealing is like really awful um because then it's like okay employer shouldn't you be focused on like the things the person is exposing as opposed to going after the person um so the you know it, it's not to say that that's never been done before but it doesn't it's rare just from an optics perspective that an employer would do that but it's still important that the whistleblower is aware of what the ramifications are and then if there is an sec route um, to bring a claim forward through a whistleblower attorney. Um, the bar for that is pretty high, but it's something that we, we always provide connections to those lawyers just so people can feel like, okay, people are, are listening to me. Lawyers are actually reviewing. They could say no, that, I, that they won't take on this case, but at least people are giving me the time of day. And I think that that's so... Um, validating for people to hear especially when they've been gaslit a lot of the times and they've been told that they're crazy or that like they should just shut up or that no one wants to listen to them so oftentimes people like the floodgates will open when people come to us because they're like wow here's a captive audience of like not just these two women but like these other lawyers and other people who will actually listen to me and still could say no to pursuing the case because the bar can be high but um they're still, you know, we still want to listen to people and hear them out. And also just to add, because I mean, before I worked in this field, I did not know, and a lot of people might not know in your audience that there are certain kinds of uh, kinds of information that if you bring it forward to the government and it involves, um, you know, fraud or securities fraud or some like a government contract that someone's like basically siphoning off money or stealing money or not delivering services, you can actually get monetary rewards for um, whistleblowing um, under these cases. So those would be the cases where you would go to a whistleblower attorney and they would evaluate your case. So whistleblowers often have to end up blowing up their life to do what they do. And so this is a way that the government incentivizes people to come forward and do that because often they'll end up blowing up their careers or losing their jobs in the process. Do you find out that that's what happens to people oftentimes when they blow the whistle? And let's presume everything was 
you know, they were right about everything, but then they get fired or get marginalized or isolated or or just they're that person sitting alone by themselves and it's just their life is made miserable. Does it does that happen quite often? It definitely can. I mean, we tried to the people who we have worked with, um, what we feel somewhat good about is that they have all, or at least what they tell us, they have moved to a better place psychologically, not always financially, but psychologically and sometimes professionally after doing this. And I think that there's this liberating feeling um, if you do it the right way and you're careful. Um, there's a liberating feeling to telling the truth about something. And like, that's the place where we hope we can bring people. People, de it definitely is lonely. And I think that that's why having um, advocates, whether it's Amber and I, or a lawyer, or just like someone on your side, someone on your team, um, as a psychological support, a moral support, it's just, it's so critical for someone who does something like this, because it is lonely. And a lot of times you're going against your former colleagues and colleagues think that you're crazy. And, um, and you are in many ways making yourself a, a martyr to do something that is in the public good or um, something that holds someone or something powerful accountable. So it's, it, I think it, it's a double-edged sword. It's very lonely and scary and it can sometimes put people in a trickier position financially. Um, but also this liberating element to it, I think is why a lot of people do it and have felt actually okay, the people who we've worked with so long as you know it's somewhat on their terms if they want anonymity or if they want um you know there are varying levels of how you can protect someone but i think that active telling the truth is very cleansing and money can't buy that like you can't um but i think that, that there is often an, inter an internal conflict for people of like do i choose security and survival and money or do I choose this like very freeing route of telling my story and the truth about something, which is like kind of at odds with survival if you really like boil it down. Um, but we, we hope to be like the team around people that helps them if they do take that, that leap and then helps them recover and connect with other people and move on to um, other work opportunities or just life opportunities if they can after they do it. And also it's, there's one thing um, that Ariela touched on in that sense of finding community. Like I think on blind, you probably find that that's a large reason why people come. And there is something in that when people come to us a story, almost every time the first thing that comes out of their mouth is, uh, I don't know if it's just me or if like, this is something bad. And then, you know, as they go through the process and they eventually go public almost to a, like as a rule, um, once a story is out there, you will find other people that have gone through similar experiences and it's really validating. And of course, having to report on anything publicly can be a really traumatic experience, but it, we have seen how much it helped people to come out on the other side, even if they did have really bad consequences. The fact that they were validated that other people said, hey, like I've been through that too. And they sort of felt connected to, uh, they got outside of that vacuum. Um, has actually really helped people, even though definitely wouldn't sugarcoat it and say that it's you know, everything always turns out great for everyone. But there are aspects of it that are affirming and healing just by getting to tell your story. Now, I'm curious, because we've, we've seen some very high profile reports of different whistleblowers like Francis Hagen at Meta and it, it seems like we haven't heard anything about Meta. Like they've just seemingly got away like scot-free, right? There's there's no one really holding them accountable for what she brought to light. And I'm always curious in terms of why some whistleblowing cases seem to get the action, get the um, the almost like resolution, right? Like an agency or, or the court of public opinion holds that company accountable and, and others they seemingly get away with? Is, is it just that 
some companies have too many resources, too much power, or is it something else entirely? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think there is the case to be made that Meta is very all powerful. I will, I will say though that you know the um, there have been congressional inquiries into it as a result, and there have been cascading waves of press around the impact of Instagram on teen girls. And you know, it's not like it's not like Meta. You know, Mark Zuckerberg is out the window, and Meta has has shut down, but. Um, there are, you know, I think with each story that comes out with each inquiry, with each line of questioning, um, with each follow-up story to the initial reporting, um, maybe it's not as clear cut as like a find, though sometimes it is, but I think just having that information out there can really inform even like on the teen girl element, like parents' decisions. We don't see that, right? It's not as like, obvious as the government taking some grand action or a court case that sends the bad guy to jail but like I think with each wave of information that gets out there you never know who's reading it or seeing it and internalizing it and um, how that's impacting their parenting decisions the limits they set for themselves on how much they use the the Instagram or Facebook or um, you know I think that can be hard to measure, but the more that the more that's exposed, I think the more we can slowly start to chip away at it and poke at it and have some equilibrium. Um, but yeah, this is all to say it's it's um, a very powerful company. I mean, if you just think how dependent we all are and how people need to advertise on Instagram and Facebook, and this is how you know WhatsApp is how people are communicating with their family members, like. It has become pretty um, omnipotent, but I think there are still ways, and we're not, I think Amber and I are not, you know, we're not of the mindset necessarily we have to tear everything down and start from scratch. I just think that that's not realistic at this point, but then how do you, given the frameworks that do exist and the reality of where people at, and maybe they're addicted to this platform, but how do you get them maybe a little bit less addicted or get parents to know more about what's going on? And I think that's the, the, you know, the place of journalism and whistleblowing and platforms um, like Blind, even for like the worker perspective um, of how the workers at Meta are being treated and like what they're saying about it, getting that out there. Um, it's just better for a, like a democracy, a functioning democracy. I also kind of just think that even with these companies, I mean, I can't say for sure because I'm not on the inside, but those kinds of public whistleblowing events are very bad for their brands. They're very bad PR. They lose customers. And I think just the very act of someone being so brave and publicly bringing forward information might make them start to change the way they do things on the inside, starting to realize that like any of this can come out really at any time. So I think that there could be that effect too, is that it just does make, remind companies that there is the possibility of accountability that will come with every one of these events, whistleblowing events that happen, because it leads to all these terrible consequences for them. I, I think that makes sense, right? Because I, I think it, it's very easy when you're experiencing it, something you know hor horrendous or, or witnessing, it, it's very easy to see like, oh, like no one has said anything. So I must be the only one. Right. And you almost try to like minimize and you have these like doubts internally. No, no one is explicitly telling you like, oh, Rick, you're, you're crazy or like for, forget what you've seen. But we, we, we do this to ourselves. And I, I want to ask, do you have any insights into why this might be like so common? Why we kind of have and we as in like the kind of collective human condition kind of have this tendency to, to, to minimize our valid concerns? I mean, it's a great question. I think that there's always the, the balance of like how you weigh the individual versus the collective. And like, if we were all too individualistic, like that would be a problem. But then if we're all too rule following and, and don't speak up about anything and don't, and, and don't, um, express ourselves, then that's a pretty miserable existence too. So um, 
we always, Amber and I talk about this idea of um, like also consensus as a, a form of reality that like reality is built when there is enough consensus about something. And of course that can be like a skewed, a very skewed version of the truth, obviously as we've seen with propaganda and um, getting or misinformation and getting people to believe enough of the wrong thing, you can just completely um, derail and, and debilitate society by getting people to believe um, something that is completely erroneous. But, you know, there are so many, um, you know, truths that exist that um, the more we, we talk about them and if we have the same experience, that can become um, the reality that, that we create. And I think corporations know this really well and powerful people know this really well. So what some, some of what we're trying to do is to get, in, get people to talk more and more about their experiences collectively. And if they all realize, okay, we all have, it could be unique, but the same general experience with this manager or this company or this, this plane or this product or this um, air quality or whatever it may be, um, then we can start to bring forward the reality as the collective sees it and um, still have the, you know, you still have the individual experience, but um, together you can collectively, you know, talk about a reality that's maybe previously been suppressed because the powers that be, it's inconvenient to um, what they want to communicate to their shareholders or to the government um, so they can remain in existence. So it's always a tricky balance, I think, um, the, like the individual versus the the collective, but both are important. And I also kind of think even myself, it's like, I mean, I don't know about if everyone's like this, but if I have a problem, like let's say I have a argument with my boyfriend, I, I will like talk to Ariella about it first. Cause you're like, okay, am I crazy? Or is this like not blah, blah, blah. I think it's just, there's something about like talking about it with someone and just getting, getting feedback or gaining perspective. And so, uh, you know, when you don't, if you feel like you're in a position where you can't talk about what's going on or like you don't talk about what's going on, it's, it is very easy to doubt yourself. And a lot of people get gaslit, like they'll be at work and they'll, you know, they'll see this thing and they'll try to talk. And then they, so then you, that can really mess with people's heads. So there is this something about um, joining like with other people that is very empowering and also just kind of makes you feel more confident that what you see is as you see it. And there's this quote that we have from Elena Fronte on our website that, that Ariel and I both love, where she talks about how stories transform the thread of writing into people, ideas, feelings, actions, humanity, life. And it, storytelling gives us the power to bring order to the chaos, chaos of the real under our own sign. And in this way, it's not very far from political power. And I think that quote's really interesting because it that is true in that like when we do all finally like bring stories forward, share our stories with each other. It does like create this, as Ariel said, a collective, like it unites all of these voices to affirm that something is wrong here. Something needs to change. And that can actually become political power. It can change culture, um, cultural power or political power or both. Now, if I'm someone that has witnessed something or think that something has been going wrong what do I do? You know, like when I reach out to you, kind of what are the steps that, you know, you, you take me through? Can, can you walk us through that process and, and kind of give us insights into kind of the resources that you can plug me into and, 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 and just bring that story to life and, and, and hold power accountable? Yeah, I think a lot of it starts with what the person's goals are and um, figuring out what leverage they may have. And it's so like, it's so unique to the person and their story. Sometimes um, like we just had one instance of, um, it was a pay equity issue where a bunch of women found out that they were being paid significantly less than a man who actually reported to them. <laughs> so they, um, they didn't want to leave the company but they wanted to come together and figure out how do we bring this to HR and get this like they had they had no issue with their male colleague, but they just wanted to see some equity to have their salaries brought up to his level. So 
um, that's one where it's like, okay, it doesn't necessarily make sense to go public. <laughs> they want to stay at the company. They, they think that they can negotiate this and they just want to bring um, awareness of this issue to HR. So we would help them um, figure out how to message it even internally to the company to, um, to rectify that issue. And then there, there are other issues where people um, have left or they plan on leaving and they really want to bring something public. So we will walk them through like how that works. Sometimes it's not newsworthy. So sometimes that can be tricky for people to hear because we're like, it's not that your story is not important. It's just not going to meet the very high bar for news because there's there are less journalists than ever these days. And um, unless it's a story about Elon Musk, they will cover anything to do with Elon Musk. <laughs> you know, they may not like be prioritizing your story. Um, so, you know, helping them figure out then, okay, if it doesn't reach that bar, are there other stories like yours? Can we group them all together and pitch a sort of trend piece that gets you and your voice heard? If it does reach that bar, um, we still have to temper expectations a little bit around the timing for journalists. A lot of people believe that, oh my God, I'm going to share this information and it will be published tonight. <laughs> it's like, that's not, especially for very difficult stories, like it can take journalists, you know, six months, nine months, a year to bring that forward. And they have to go to their legal team and they have to do all of this corroboration. So explaining to people how it works, because I think, I don't know where this misconception came from, but maybe the movies or maybe just people's fear of having, um, having you know, something private brought forth publicly, but people just think that a journalist is gonna publish them instantly. So helping them understand, yes, like you will, but like, here's the process, they have to do this vetting. And um, so there's just a lot that goes into it. It really depends on the person's appetite for risk and their goals and their, um, what they want to achieve and then what's realistic from a legal and press perspective um, to, to get the story out there, or get them some form of justice. Now, this this point about what is newsworthy is quite interesting to me, right? Because, you know, just my personal life, like my day job is as a PR person, I have to work with reporters and kind of navigate, you know, whether anything that we do or that we want to share, will it actually have a high probability or high chance of reaching that kind of interest in terms of the journalist, in terms of that outlet's you know, readership, the audience, or, or just what's going on in the current like zeitgeist. And, and, and so I, I've come to learn this intimately, but also, you know, I, I'm also a reporter where if I had to experience and say, oh gosh, like, like these, these people that are reaching out to me, they're very interesting personally, but I, I just can't get this past my editor or I, I just can't get, you know, enough buy-in for my audience to actually be interested, right? I, where does this kind of line go when, when you're working and someone comes to you and it, it almost seems like immediately or inherently valuable, right? For, for the general population to know about it. Do you, do you ever kind of like push back with the reporters, with the editors to say like, no, actually, hey, this is newsworthy. Like the Boeing example seems to be um, like a, a glaring one, right? Where that problem that is supposedly fixed is, is still in progress. That's still a, a, a potential safety hazard out there. I mean, that's why we started publishing ourselves as a media company, because um, sometimes the bar didn't make sense to us. And also, also there was also, there's a whole other hurdle, which is the legal departments, because even though a story can be verified, fact-checked, multiple sources, sometimes the person it's about or the company it's about is known to be very litigious. And that will raise another layer of hurdles. And so um, there's been stories we've had that we felt were about quite, you know, very much in the public interest that we just um, had dead ends everywhere. And so 
that was when we decided, well, we'll look into whether we could just publish them. And so we, we are a legitimate publisher. We have media insurance and um, we just started publishing ourselves because yes, we do have legal reviews. We work with lawyers, but ultimately the decision is ours um, and probably our appetite for risk might be higher than some lawyers. <laughs> um, <laughs> I say that's true. <laughs> Um, and so, but we felt it was worth it and in the public interest to do so. And, you know, we've come to the brink of, we've had legal threats um, come to the brink of getting, you know, entangled in a lawsuit. Um, but, you know, we're also kind of different than a normal news outlet in that, you know, if any of these entities, and I think this is ultimately why they stood down, was that if they ever came at us and did file a legal case, well, then the story that we as a pretty small platform had put out there that maybe not everyone was seeing yet will suddenly become a matter of public records. And then everyone will write about it because um, then the legal risk goes down if they're just reporting on a lawsuit. So like that's sort of like a tension that Linus kind of we work with and that we try to leverage the power we have in a way because we're small and scrappy and nimble to face down the powerful in a way that sometimes like the New York Times cannot just because of their position, their relation, relational position of power. So that's the part of our work that is kind of risky, but um, we also know that we we're, we're good at, we're good at like standing up for the small guy. And if it ever came to that, that's what we would do. Now, I'm curious, is there anything else that we should know about if you know we we we've seen something like or you know just anything we should know about in terms of like what a whistleblower is and 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 accomplishes i um, think I, go ahead okay. ariel go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> um well i think it's i think i mentioned this a little bit earlier but whistleblower is such a negative word to a lot of people, but I think the reality is we all have some of that energy within us, like that energy of like wanting to, we like the phrase like poke at power and like, because if you ask anyone like, do you like underdogs? They will say yes. <laughs> do you like, you know, in the David versus Goliath story, like, you know, do you like to see the David face down a Goliath? Like I've pretty much everyone, um, maybe unless you're a sociopath, would say yes. Um, but I think it's it's interesting that the the word and like the the um the name um has become so distorted into like, oh, this person is disgruntled or angry. Or, and like sure people can feel a spectrum of emotions. They can be angry in the process of doing all of this. But I think it's um it is like passion and a desire to fight for oneself that's at the heart of what all of this is and I think it's um you know sometimes you have to be tactful about when you use it but I think that we all have some of that energy within us um that we can tap into when we need to and um that doesn't mean that you're testifying in front of congress necessarily but I think it's for people to feel that they have agency to taking control of a situation where they felt powerless or where their colleagues felt powerless um, or where they were mistreated. Um, I think it's something that we should all continue to do. And I also kind of think an important way to think about this too. Um, I don't know how many employers listen to your podcast, but um, I would, what I would really like to see change is the way that companies respond to whistleblowers because most whistleblowers, they will say almost across the board that they tried to ring the bell on the internal you know, channels and that HR didn't help or ignore them or suppress them. Um, and also I was just putting something together and I found the statistic that 90% of CEOs and CFOs stated in a survey that they think improving their work culture would benefit the financials of their company. So there's like a disconnect. Companies like fear the whistleblower. They want to tamp down these voices of internal dissent or the people that are pointing out things that are wrong. But actually research shows that companies that do listen to their employees and root out problems 
um, benefit greatly from doing so. So this idea of like the whistler comes out and the first thing the company does publicly is try to discredit them. Like we see it as a rule, you know, with the Twitter whistleblower, um, like every single whistleblower that comes forward, the company will try to like throw out some accusation to discredit the whistleblower instead of just like owning it and actually getting to the root of the problem and making their companies better and more successful. So like, I would love to see a flip where companies start to see somebody who's coming to them with a problem as a positive thing, not a negative thing long before the people go public because it gives them a chance to right wrongs and make their workplace better and probably make their companies better. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm so glad you say that because I'm often asked that by um, CEOs, heads of HR, heads of people, heads of PR, um, what they can do with all their employees posting on blind or all of the leaks of information to the press. And the first thing I often tell them is, do you have any, av or ask them is, do you have any avenues internally, right? Are you listening to your employees or do you have any kind of like productive outlet where this feedback can be accepted and incorporated and are you actually taking action, right? Because often leaks are kind of the last resort, right? Where they feel like they're not being heard there are no outlets available. And so they go on blind to validate or to share because they want it to, I mean, what they want to hold that power to account, right? They want change an impactful change to happen. And sometimes they kind of feel at what's end and say, well, th this has got to be the only way to do it. No one else is listening to me. So I'm going to self publish or, or just do it myself. And I often see kind of quite visibly the executives that there's something that goes off, right? Where they realize, oh gosh, yeah, I, I don't have any of those outlets and um, perhaps this is why. And, and so I'm so glad that you bring that survey result, that hard data, Amber, because it, it's exactly true, right? Um, and, and it does have a meaningful impact on their business, like hard consequences if you don't do those things. Yeah. So Ariella, Amber, I, I really appreciate this like insight into kind of the psyche of whistleblowing, what exactly happens and, and all of these stories that need to be told. So thanks for coming on the show. Of course, thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you.